everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you've never seen my face before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will notify you every time that i post but anyway this week we are going to be discussing the solved case of the Gainesville Ripper, a serial killer who murdered eight people within just one year between 1989 and 1990. The Ripper was actually able to escape detection for quite some time. The police investigating this case even thought that another man was responsible for a while. However, eventually he was ruled out and the real murderer was finally caught. But before we get into the case, I do just want to say a huge thank you to HelloFresh for kindly sponsoring this video. HelloFresh are a meal kit delivery service that offers a huge variety of recipes every single week to help you get out of your recipe. Rut. I feel like a lot of people will definitely be able to relate to this but before myself and my family started using HelloFresh we would just constantly be cooking the same meals every week and we would rarely change it up because none of us are really that great at cooking. <laughs> but since using HelloFresh we've been switching it up all the time and we are making meals that we have never even tried before. HelloFresh makes cooking so much easier because you you just pick the meal that you want to try on their website and they will send you the instructions and a box full of all the ingredients that you need for that meal which is amazing because not only do you not have to make a trip to the supermarket to get the ingredients yourself but it also means that there is less food waste because they will send you the correct amount of ingredients that you need for the amount of people that you are cooking for so if you are cooking just for yourself then they will send you enough ingredients just for you but if you are cooking for four people then they will send you enough ingredients for four. I personally love HelloFresh because I'm actually a vegetarian and they offer such a wide range of vegetarian options. They also have pescatarian options as well as low carb options but yeah I find it really helpful because I am a vegetarian but the rest of my family are not however I do cook for my family quite often alongside my sister. So a lot of the time I will pick a vegetarian meal kit for myself and then I will pick another meal kit for my family. And another reason why I love HelloFresh is because they are committed to giving back. In 2020 alone they donated over 4 million meals to charity and they are continuing to step up their food donations amid the coronavirus crisis. They're just really really great and I cannot recommend their service enough. So if you want to give HelloFresh a try then you can go to to hellofresh.com and use my code which is 12molly to get 12 yes 12 free meals and free shipping which is just incredible once again that's the code 12molly to get 12 free meals thank you so so much to hellofresh once again for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel and now let's just get into the case of the Gainesville Ripper so for today's case we are going all the way back to the year 19 90 in obviously Gainesville which is a city in northern Florida in the US. Gainesville was a pretty nice place to live from what I can gather crime rates were relatively low. Well the police there had a few crimes related to theft and drunk and disorderly incidents but on the whole it was a fairly safe place to be. Many people that lived there would even leave their doors unlocked at night because they didn't think that they had anything to worry about or at least that was until this case took place. It was August of 1990 so it was the fall and a new school year at the University of Florida was just about to begin. So university students were leaving their family homes and they were getting dropped off at their college campuses in preparation for the new semester and two of these students were two friends 18 year old Sonia Larson and 17 year old Christina Powell. Both Sonia and 
Christina were going to be freshmen this school year at the University of Florida. So they had just graduated from high school the year before. Sonia Larson was the youngest of her siblings. She was the baby of the family and she was from Deerfield Beach in Florida. She was an honours student and she absolutely loved children. She was a very caring person and she dreamed of having a career in education. She wanted to be a nursery school teacher. Sonia was also the manager of her basketball team and she was a passionate member of Students Against Drink Driving. 17 year old Christina Powell was I believe originally from Jacksonville and she used to write columns for her high school's magazine and she was an editor for the yearbook. Christina often attended her church's youth group. She absolutely loved Bible study and she decided that she wanted to major in theology but she was also interested in architecture and the two girls met each other during the summer semester because they shared a dorm together and then fast forward to August of 1990 as I said it was a new school year and both girls were going to be attending the University of Florida. Sonia and Christina arrived in Gainesville on Friday the 24th of August and they began moving all of their stuff into their new apartment that they shared which was at the Williamsburg Village Apartment Complex and it was only about four blocks away from school. They spent the majority of that Friday just unloading their cars and unpacking and they also went to the local Walmart to pick up a couple of things for their new place. Later that day they went out for dinner and then on their way back to their apartment they stopped at a local store because Sonia needed to use the payphone to ring her mother because the girls hadn't set up their home phone yet. After this they went back home and they probably just started to wind down for the evening and they decided that they were going to carry on with the unpacking the next day. And both Christina and Sonia were just so excited. This was the next chapter of their lives, a new adventure for them and they were looking forward to the upcoming school year. However sadly the two girls would never get to start their studies at university because they were viciously killed before the semester had even begun. Now, as I mentioned previously, Sonia and Christina moved into their apartment on Friday the 24th of August. And two days later on the Sunday, their third roommate was due to arrive to the dorm. Another girl was moving in with them. And that day, Christina's parents had also planned to come up and visit their daughter and just have a look around her new home. However, it got to Sunday and Christina's parents were a little concerned because they hadn't heard from Christina in a couple of days. The last time they heard from her was that previous Friday when she moved in. And Sonia Larson's parents and her boyfriend hadn't heard anything from her either. In fact, no one had heard from the two girls in days which just seemed quite strange but I don't think people thought too much into this they probably just assumed that the two girls were busy they had just moved in and so they were most likely just preoccupied with unpacking and sorting out their new home and so even though Christina's parents hadn't been in contact with their daughter for a while they still decided to head to her new place in Gainesville on Sunday the 26th of August to see her as planned. However, when they got there and they knocked on Christina and Sonia's door, there was no answer. And at this point, their concerns were only growing. They were very, very worried about the girls. And so they decided to contact the local police and ask them to break the door down to see if the girls were inside. The police arrived at the apartment shortly after and they knocked down the front door. And when they did, they came across a horrific scene. Inside that apartment were the dead bodies of 18 year old Sonia Larson and 17 year old Christina Powell and it was clear just from looking at the scene 
that they had been murdered. The police now had a double homicide on their hands and it was determined that the victims had been dead for quite a while. They'd probably been killed that Friday night, their first night in the apartment or in the early hours of Saturday morning. The first body that the police found was Sonia Larson's and she was discovered on her waterbed upstairs on the top floor of the apartment. It's believed that she was probably asleep when she was attacked which is why she was on the bed and she had been stabbed with a knife 20 times by her killer. Now Sonia's body looked as though it had been pulled to the bottom of of her bed by her legs and there was blood smear marks on the bed where her body had been dragged and after she had been dragged to the bottom of the bed the killer spread her legs and left her in a lewd position. Christina Powell's body was found downstairs in the apartment and it was soon determined that her murder had lasted a lot longer than Sonia's. The killer had spent more time with Christina. Christina had been raped and and her wrist had been bound with duct tape to stop her from trying to fight off her attacker. However, this tape was not found at the scene. They could tell that she had been bound with tape because of sticky residue marks on her wrist, but the killer had removed this tape after her death and taken it away with him. Christina was found lying on her back. She had also been stabbed to death, and just like with Sonia, her legs had been spread spread apart and left in that position and her clothes had been cut from her body with a knife and then just ripped off. However, the killer didn't stop there. After Christina was dead, they actually mutilated her body. Whoever had done this had actually cut off Christina's nipples and these were never found at the scene. So the murderer had taken those with him, probably as a sick trophy. The murder weapon was also not recovered at the scene, but from looking at the stab wounds on the victim's bodies, the police were able to determine that a military survival K-bar seven inch knife was the type of knife that was used here. However, something that was found at the scene was a towel and a bottle of dishwasher detergent and this was discovered next to Christina Powell's body and the police believe that the killer used this to wash Christina's body in an attempt to try and get rid of any evidence of rape because as we know Christina was sexually assaulted. So after the two bodies had been found an investigation was immediately launched to try and catch who had done this to the girls and why what was the motive here was this just a random attack or had Sonia and Christina been targeted for some reason the police were looking into a few different theories one of them being burglary they were thinking maybe this was a burglary gone wrong situation. However, this was eventually ruled out because it didn't seem like anything had been stolen from the girl's apartment. They also looked into the possibility that maybe this was a romance gone sour situation. Maybe a love interest or a former love interest of Sonia's or Christina's had done this. But once again, this theory was eventually ruled out. The evidence they had and the way in which the girls were killed made it seem more like this was just a random attack. It didn't seem like this was personal. It seemed like the girls had been killed by a complete stranger. The police actually thought that this double homicide could have potentially been the start of a serial killer because some of the details of this attack bore similarities to serial killer cases. So for example, the fact that the girls had been bound. This is a common characteristic of serial killers to bound their victims. The fact that Christina's nipples had been cut off and taken away, that is another thing Thing that we see often. Serial killers will often take something away from the crime scene, whether that be a part of the victim's bodies or just an object that they find at the murder site. They will take something because it reminds them of what they did and they want to be reminded because they get 
pleasure out of it. Another fact about the case that suggested to the police that this was a potential serial killer was the way in which the girls' bodies were left. They were both positioned with their legs spread apart. They were both posed in a very, in very sexually degrading ways. Again, serial killers will often do something like that because, well, one, they want to humiliate their victims and two, they want the person or people that find the bodies to be even more shocked when they come across the scene. Just a lot of things about these two murders indicated to the police that this was possibly the start of a killing spree and they were right. In fact, before the police even really had a chance to properly start investigating this case, they had another murder on their hands. 18-year-old Krista Hoyt was an honours student. She studied chemistry at Santa Fe Community College and she had decided that after college she was going to transfer to the University of Florida because her dream was to work in forensic science with the FBI one day. She wanted to be a crime lab technician. Krista was described as being a very dependable young girl. She was always someone that you could rely on and she was also very cautious and safety conscious. People said that she would never open the door to a stranger. At the time of this case taking place, Krista had a job at the Alachua County Sheriff's Department and there she worked in like the records section and she was due to go into work for an overnight shift on Saturday evening, so August the 25th. However, it got to the early hours of the morning on August the 26th and Krista just hadn't shown up for her shift. And as I literally just said, Krista was a very reliable person, so this was incredibly strange and out of character for her to just not turn up for work. And so because of this, because this was so unusual, her colleagues were pretty worried about her, and so they decided to notify the police so that an officer could conduct a welfare check on Krista. At around 12.30, to 1am an officer was dispatched and sent to Krista's apartment but when he knocked on the door there was no answer. He continued knocking for a few more minutes but still no one was responding and the door itself was locked so he couldn't get in. So this officer started walking around the side of the apartment maybe just to see if any lights were on inside or if maybe he could get a look inside the apartment through like a window and as he was walking around he noticed the chain link fence that was around Krista's apartment looked as though it had been pushed down as if someone had walked over it. Now Krista had a sliding glass bedroom door in her apartment and as the officer got closer to this door he could tell that someone had recently tampered with it, tampered with the lock. And in front of this glass door was a blind and this blind was pulled down almost all of the way apart from right at the bottom on one side the blind was raised a little bit. So this officer got onto the floor, onto his hands and knees, he grabbed his torch and he aimed it inside of the apartment through this little like gap at the bottom of the blind and when he did he saw the dead body of 18 year old Krista Hoyt and she had been decapitated. Krista was found completely naked and her headless body was slumped over her bed but it was like the killer had tried to make her sit up. She had been posed in like a sitting position on her bed and her head had been placed on a bookshelf that was directly opposite her body. However, internal blood pooling of her body indicated to authorities that she had led face down on her bed for quite some time before she was propped up and decapitated, suggesting that the perpetrator had killed Krista and then he just hung around in her apartment with her dead body for several hours before finally decapitating her and 
positioning her body. Krista's clothes had been cut from her body and ripped off. She had been sexually assaulted and she had also been bound with tape and this tape was removed after her death and the killer had taken it away with them. But again they could tell that she had previously been bound with tape because there were sticky residue marks on her wrist. Her cause of death was just from one single stab wound in her back but this stab wound had punctured her heart and it was determined that the knife that had caused this wound was the same style knife that had been used to kill Sonia Larson and Christina Powell just hours earlier and just like with Christina Powell Krista Hoyt had also been mutilated post-mortem her nipples had also been sliced off there were just so many similarities between these three murders three young girls around the same age age had been killed within hours of each other and so the police knew that they had all been killed by the same person they really did have a serial killer on their hands and of course the people of Gainesville were terrified this person had already taken the lives of three innocent young women and everyone especially other young women were so scared that they would be next parents started calling their children constantly to check up on them because obviously most of them were away at university although some students actually packed up all of their things and returned to their family homes because this killer seemed to be targeting students so they were just so panicked people were going out and stocking up on self-defense items like baseball bats stun guns handguns mace students were moving in with one another and they were sleeping in shifts so that one person could always keep an eye out for any intruders female students were asking their male friends to stay in their apartments with them believing that the killer would possibly think twice about breaking in if another male was present. These murders really just sent shockwaves throughout Gainesville and they spread so much panic, especially because it seemed like the police weren't really any closer to catching the perpetrator. And because no one knew who this guy was, people started to come up with their own theories and rumours quickly started to spread. One rumour was that the killer was a pizza delivery delivery driver, another was that the killer was a doctor and another was that he was actually a police officer which is why it was so easy for him to murder because usually no one suspects a police officer. The killer wasn't a police officer by the way but at the time people believed that he could have been which only made them feel more scared. During the investigation the police came up with a profile of their killer. They theorised what kind of person this guy was so they could narrow down their suspects. They believed that the murderer was a white male probably in his late 20s to mid 30s. He was probably single and a bit of a loner. He likely didn't have many friends and they believed that he had average to above average intelligence. The way in which these murders were carried out suggested to detectives that the killer was likely to be quite athletic with a muscular build. He would have needed to be pretty strong to hold down his victims and decapitate one of them. They theorised that he probably had some criminal history and that he may have even had some military experience or some experience or connection to law enforcement. And he was clearly a very organised killer. He planned these murders. He planned exactly how he was going to carry them out. And he was also very careful not to leave anything at the scene that could be traced back to him, including his DNA. He actually washed his victims' bodies with soap after they were dead in an attempt to get rid of any evidence. So he was very 
calculating and very very cautious and not long after the first three murders this calculating killer struck again the next victims of the Gainesville serial killer were 23 year old Tracy Paulis and 23 year old Manuel Taboda Tracy Paulis was originally from Miami she was a former homecoming queen at her high school as well as a softball and a soccer player she was very athletic and she loved sports Sports. She was also a member of the National Honor Society and at the time of this case taking place she was a senior student studying law at the University of Florida. 23 year old Manny Taboda was actually very good friends with Tracy. They had gone to high school together and they graduated together. Manny used to play football a lot at his high school and he was also the president of his high school's thespian club which I think is like a theatre club and he absolutely adored his cat Sasha. Manny used to joke that the woman in his life was his cat and Manny was also a student just like Tracy and his dream was to one day become an architect. Tracy and Manny were incredibly close like I just said they were really really good friends and they were just friends they didn't have any kind of romantic relationship or anything like that and because they were such good friends and they were both at college they decided to move in together in an apartment at Gatorwood apartment complex which was about a mile away from their college campus however on the morning of the 28th of August 1990 the manager of the Gatorwood apartment complex actually received a very troubling phone call from one of Manny Taboda's friends. This friend was really worried about Manny and his roommate Tracy because he hadn't heard from either of them in quite a while. Neither of them had been answering their phones. And so this friend asked the manager of the complex if he could let him into Manny and Tracy's apartment to see if they were in there and if they were okay. And this manager agreed. So they went to the the apartment and the manager unlocked the door but when they opened the door slightly and they looked inside they immediately knew that something was wrong. They spotted a black bag on the floor and I believe also either some blood or a body, what looked like a body on the floor and it was at this point that they decided not to go any further. They just shut the door and they decided to call the police thinking that the apartment was a potential crime scene and they were right when the police arrived and they went inside the apartment they discovered the dead bodies of Manny Taboda and Tracy Paulis. However the black bag that Manny's friend and the apartment manager saw on the floor was now gone. It was nowhere to be found suggesting that when they first arrived at Manny and Tracy's apartment the killer was probably still in there and that when he heard the door open he quickly grabbed his bag and fled the scene. He was very very lucky to escape without being caught or even just being seen. Tracy's body was the first to be found and she was lying on her back in the hallway in the apartment. It was determined that she too had been bound with tape because she had tape marks on her wrists and this indicated that she hadn't been killed right away. The killer had spent time with her, probably torturing her before she was murdered. According to one source, Tracy's hair was actually damp when she was found, which suggested to the police that she was probably attacked just after she had gotten out of the shower. She was sexually assaulted and she was stabbed in the back three times with the same knife that had been used to kill the first three victims. And then once she was dead, the killer dragged her naked body to the hallway and he positioned her in a sexually degrading way and her body was also washed in an attempt to get rid of any evidence. As for Manny Taboda, his body was discovered in his own bed and it's believed that he was probably sleeping when he was attacked and the police think that he was killed first. He was killed before Tracy and he was probably killed first because if the killer started attacking Tracy and Manny was still alive, 
alive, he would have probably been able to overpower the attacker because Manny was a physically fit and strong young man. So the killer needed to get him out of the way so that he could then go on to kill Tracy without any interruption. Manny really tried to fight for his life. He had a lot of self-defense wounds and the detectives could tell that there was a violent struggle between him and the killer. However, unfortunately, Manny was unable to defend himself for long because, of course, the killer had a knife and Manny was stabbed many, many times. He had stab wounds all over his body, on his arms, on his legs, his neck, chest, face, in his abdomen. He had sustained a lot of injuries. And the fact that the attacker had now killed a male made the community even more terrified because before this killer seemed to be just targeting young women, young women who all had very similar looks. They were all petite young girls with dark brunette hair. So it was it was just assumed that that was the killer's victim type. People thought that he would only murder other girls that looked like his female victims. But now he had murdered Manny too. He had murdered a man. So it seemed like he was just targeting anyone that he came across or he was killing anyone that got in his way so anyone could be next. So because of this, the police really upped the scale of this investigation and they put law enforcement everywhere. There was a police officer pretty much on every single street because they were so fearful that this person would kill again. Gun and mace sales just completely skyrocketed. Sorority houses and campuses hired 24 hour security guards because the victims were all students and like I mentioned earlier, a lot of students just decided to pack it in all together. Many of them just decided to go back to their hometowns and they just completely abandoned their studies because they were just so, so scared. Every single student feared for their life. And because of how quick these murders were happening, like the first two victims, Sonia Larson and Christina Powell had been killed, it's believed either late, Friday evening or early Saturday morning. The next victim, Krista Hoyt, was killed either late Saturday evening or early Sunday morning. And then Manny and Tracy were killed either late Monday evening or early Tuesday morning. So all of the victims had been killed literally within a few days of each other. And because of this, because of how fast this was all happening, everyone expected to hear the news of a sixth murder within hours after the last bodies were found. However, that news never actually came. It was very odd. These murders happened so, so quickly. And then all of a sudden, they just stopped completely and people couldn't work out why. Meanwhile, as the police were patrolling the area and trying to narrow down suspects, forensic teams were working on trying to find some of the killer's DNA from the evidence that had been collected so far. So like from the victim's bodies and from their clothing and just other items and objects that were at the crime scenes. And five days after the bodies of the first two victims were found, scientists had a breakthrough. They found traces of the killer's semen on Christina Powell's underwear and also on a paper towel that was near her body. And they also found traces of semen on the body of the third victim, Krista Hoyt. And the semen on Krista Hoyt's body was a match to the semen from Christina Powell's underwear. So that was confirmation that they had come from the same individual. So now that they had samples of the killer's DNA, they could use this to test against DNA samples of any suspects. And hopefully that way they can narrow down the search for the Gainesville serial killer. And the police had a lot of potential suspects in the Gainesville Ripper case. They had a list of just under seven hundred suspects. I think it was like 675 suspects that they had to go through. However, there was one name on this list in particular that looked the most promising. One man 
that the police were very suspicious of, more so than any other suspect. And his name was Edward Lewis Humphrey. Edward Humphrey was 18 years old and he, like most of the victims, was a student at the University of Florida. According to sources, Edward was a bit of a loner. He didn't really socialise with people that often and he didn't really have many friends. He had been in and out of mental institutions for a few years and until very recently, he actually used to live in the Gatorwood apartment complex which if you remember was where Manny Taboda and Tracy Paulus lived but just a week before their murders he was evicted from the complex he was kicked out because he actually used to threaten the other tenants with a knife Edward Humphrey just had a bit of a violent reputation one source stated that one time he went into a local donut shop and he talked to the staff about how he thought about murdering young women. Another source stated that on another occasion he was in the local bank and he told one of the employees that he had knives at his home that could slice the skin off of her body. He also used to tell people that he despised women. He just had such a hatred for women for some reason. So yeah, he had this reputation as just being a very violent and odd young man. And so when these murders occurred, a lot of people believed that Edward Humphrey could have been the killer. I mean, it makes sense. We know that he was a very violent person. He would carry around a knife and he hated women. And obviously most of the Gainesville Ripper victims were women. So during the investigation, many people gave Edward's name over to the police and he quickly became pretty much the main suspect in this inquiry. And luckily, they were actually able to arrest Humphrey on an assault charge unrelated to this case. Basically, he had recently assaulted his grandmother and so they arrested him for that and he was taken into custody. And whilst he was in custody, it gave the police the opportunity to interview him and interrogate him about the five Gainesville murders. Now, I only read this next part on one source, so I'm not sure if it is true, but apparently during Edward's interrogation, he actually told the police that he had a split personality named John, and that John committed the five murders. So he basically admitted to the Gainesville killings. However, the police couldn't just take Edward's word for it. They needed to find concrete evidence to prove whether or not he was telling the truth because he was clearly mentally ill. He had some form of mental illness, so he could have been lying. So detectives obtained a search warrant and they went to search both Edward's apartment apartment, his grandmother's home and his car for any evidence. In particular, what the police were looking for was, of course, the murder weapon, the knife that was used to kill the five students, and also the tools that the killer had used to break into their apartments. Because it was determined that the killer had broken into the victims' homes by breaking or tampering with the locks using certain tools like screwdrivers and things. And during these searches, the police did find a couple of knives and some tools that belonged to Humphrey. And so they were collected and taken in to be tested. And they also took samples of Humphrey's DNA to test against the DNA that they had of the killer. So they took his blood, hair and saliva. In October of 1990, Edward Humphrey was found guilty of the aggravated assault against his grandmother and he was sentenced to spend 22 months in a state mental hospital. And a few weeks after this, the results of the DNA test came back, the test they were conducting to see if Edward's DNA was a match to the DNA the detectives had of the Gainesville Ripper. Obviously, they were conducting these tests in the early 90s, so DNA and forensic technology was still very new. It was in its infancy, which is why it had taken a few weeks for the results 
supposed to come back. However, when they did, the detectives were shocked because Edward Humphrey's DNA was not a match to the killer's DNA. He was not the Gainesville serial killer. And so he was completely ruled out. They didn't have any concrete evidence against him, which meant that the detectives were almost back to where they'd started. They really, really thought that Edward was their guy but he wasn't and the real killer was still out there somewhere. So after this setback in the investigation, the detectives decided to turn to a program created by the FBI called VICAP. VICAP stands for the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program and it's basically a database designed to track and correlate violent crimes. So in this database is a list of all violent crimes committed in the US and it means that detectives investigating a case can compare details of the crime that they are looking into with other cases in the database to see if any of them are similar and could have possibly been committed by the same person. Investigators can basically input details about their cases into the database and the database itself will flag up any other crimes that have almost identical details if that makes sense. So this is what the detectives did in this case. They entered details about the five Gainesville murders into the program. So for example, they would have put in what kind of weapon was used, what kind of positions the bodies were left in, whether the victims were sexually assaulted, all of these kind of details. And then they waited to see if any similar murders had occurred elsewhere that they could link to the Gainesville Ripper. And from doing this, the detectives received quite a promising lead. The program had flagged up another violent crime that was very similar to the five student murders in Gainesville. It was a triple homicide case from Shreveport, which is a city in northwest Louisiana, and this triple homicide was unsolved. The police in Louisiana had never been able to catch the killer. The murders occurred just under a year before the Gainesville murders in November of 1989 and the victims were Julie Grissom who was 24 years old, her father Tom Grissom who was 55 years old and their nephew, well Julie's nephew and Tom's grandson Sean who was just eight years old. Tom Grissom and his grandson Sean were discovered dead in their living room and they had both been stabbed to death and then Julie's body was found in a bedroom in the home on a bed and she had three stab wounds in the back and it was determined that the knife that had been used to murder Julie, Tom and Sean was the same kind of knife that was used to murder the five Gainesville victims a year later. Now it was clear to the investigators that Julie Grissom was the intended target of this attacker because they had spent more time with Julie before and after the murder. I believe she had been sexually assaulted. She was completely naked when she was found and she had also been bound with duct tape which was then removed after her death and taken away. After the murder she had been dragged to the end of the bed and posed. Her legs were hanging off of the bed and her hair had been like spread out around her head almost like fanned out. Julie's body had also been washed and so had her clothes. The killer had actually taken her clothes off of her body and he washed them in the washing machine. So he was clearly very forensically aware. And I also read on one source that the killer had poured vinegar over Julie's vaginal area and a towel was also found close to her feet. There were just so many similarities between Julie's murder and the murders of the four female Gainesville victims. Like, for example, they had all been sexually assaulted, they had all been bound with duct tape, they had all been posed, the killer had washed all of their bodies. It was clear that Julie was the intended target of this attacker because she also looked very similar to the other female victims. She was a petite young woman who had dark brunette hair. 
there and it's believed that the killer just decided to murder Julie's father and her nephew too just to get them out of the way, just like with Manny Taboda. It's obvious that this killer only killed men when he absolutely had to. He didn't set out to kill men, he just wanted to kill women. But if a man got in his way, he didn't have a problem with ending their life just to get to his intended victim. So after looking into this crime some more, this triple homicide, the detectives investigating the Ripper murders were almost certain that the two cases were linked. There were just so many similarities between them. They strongly believed that the person who murdered the Grissom family was the same person that carried out the five student murders a year later in Gainesville. And if their theory was correct, that means this serial killer had actually taken the lives of eight people. So with this theory in mind, the detectives from both jurisdictions began looking into their list of suspects and trying to pinpoint whether any of them had been in both Louisiana and Florida at the time of the murders. Because obviously the Grissom murders had taken place in Shreveport in Louisiana and the murders of Sonia, Christina, Krista, Manuel and Tracy had taken place in Gainesville in Florida and as they were doing this the police department in Shreveport received a call from another police department in Ocala which is a city in Florida and this phone call would ultimately prove to be the breakthrough the police had been waiting for. The police department in Ocala told Shreveport police that they had just arrested a man on an armed robbery charge. He had basically robbed a grocery store in Ocala at gunpoint and he stole all of the money from the cash registers. This man fled the scene however he was eventually apprehended and arrested and after the Ocala police looked into this man they actually discovered that he was a wanted man in Shreveport because he had attempted to murder his own father. This man's name was Danny Harold Rowling and he was 30 27 years old at this point in 1990. But before we go any further with the actual case, let me just tell you a little bit more about Danny Rowling and his background. So Danny Rowling was born on the 26th of May 1954 and he was born in Shreveport in Louisiana so I believe he had lived there all throughout his childhood. His parents were called James and Claudia Rowling and he also had a younger brother called Kevin. His father James Rowling actually worked as a police officer believe it or not but he was also a war veteran and according to one source James may have suffered um, with PTSD after his time in the army and James really was not a nice man at all. He treated his wife and two children awfully. He was both verbally and physically abusive. I read on one source that James never actually wanted children so perhaps he held some sort of resentment towards his two boys Danny and Kevin but yeah he was very very abusive in fact the first time he ever the first time he was ever physically violent towards Danny was when he was just one year old he beat Danny up when he was a baby because apparently he wasn't crawling properly and as Danny got older the abuse only got worse his mother Claudia also suffered really badly at the hands of of her husband James. One time she actually ran to the local hospital because James had forced her to cut herself with razor blades and she did try to escape the abuse on multiple occasions. She left James countless times however every single time she would eventually just go back to him. As for Danny's school life I couldn't really find much information about what that was like for him actually. I don't believe he really had 
that many friends in school but I did read on one source that his school counsellors said that he was quote suffering from an inferiority complex with aggressive tendencies and poor impulse control. As he entered his teenage years Danny turned to music to try and cope with his abusive home life and one Christmas he was actually gifted a guitar which he absolutely adored. Music was an escape for him. However, he was still really struggling mentally with the abuse from his father. He even attempted suicide a few times and eventually he started using drugs and drinking alcohol, which again was kind of like a form of escapism for him but of course soon enough this only made his mental health worse and it was around this time when he was like 14-15 years old that Danny started um like committing robberies I think he was like committing petty theft and stuff like that and he also started spying on young women getting changed. He would just watch women through their windows. One time his neighbours caught him watching their daughter while she was getting changed and when they told Danny's father James about this, he beat Danny for it. In an attempt to get away from his father, Danny joined the Air Force. However, he wasn't actually there for long. In 1972, he was kicked out because of his drug use. And following this, he did try to get his life back on track and he even got married and had a child with his wife. However, in 1977, when Danny was around 23 years old, his wife left him because he threatened to kill her. He had been abused by his father for years and now he was doing the exact same to his wife and child. And he was so, so angry at his wife for divorcing him. He hated her for this. And not long after their separation, he actually raped another woman that he didn't know just because she looked like his ex-wife. He also started committing armed robberies. And in the 1980s, he was constantly in and out of jail jail due to these robberies and when he was out of jail he would do a bit of traveling and he would commit robberies on the go and he would also force himself on women he would assault several women however in may of 1990 he was back living with his family in shreveport including his father james and of course as you've probably guessed now that he was living back home the abuse from his father started Started up again but this time Danny was not prepared to put up with it as he had done for many years and so during one argument with his father he pulled out a gun and he shot him I think once in the stomach and once in the head and as soon as he shot him Danny just ran and he left his father for dead however his father didn't actually die he survived although I think he did lose an eye and an ear but yeah Danny went on the run and he actually changed his identity using papers he had stolen after breaking into someone's house and from this point on he told people his name was Michael Kennedy. He fled to Kansas and Florida after this and eventually he found himself in Gainesville coincidentally just as the Gainesville murders began. But back to where we were before in the case. So as I said 37 year old Danny was arrested in Ocala in Florida on an armed robbery charge and the Ocala police contacted the Shreveport police in Louisiana because he was a wanted man in Shreveport for the attempted murder of his father James. So now the police had this man in custody, a man that they knew had a lengthy criminal history and who could also be very very violent a man that was capable of murder he literally tried to kill his own father so they began thinking that maybe he was responsible 
for the Gainesville murders, maybe Danny Rowling was the Gainesville Ripper. So whilst the detectives were investigating this lead, investigating Danny Rowling, they started looking through other unsolved armed robbery cases that happened in Gainesville around the same time as the five student murders to see if they could link any of them to Danny Rowling. And they did. On the same morning that the third victim, Krista Hoyt's body, had been discovered, there had been an armed robbery at a bank not far from Krista's apartment and the police now believed that Danny Rowling was responsible for that. They believed that he was the one who robbed that bank. However, from what I can gather, Danny didn't commit this robbery at the bank alone. He had an accomplice and at the time, the police believed the two suspects in this robbery were a white male and a black male. And later that same day, the police actually chased a white male and a black male into a local woods thinking that perhaps they were the two guys that had committed this robbery. The police were able to catch the black male. I think actually he just gave himself up to the police. However, the white male didn't. He carried on running and he escaped. But the man that they had caught told them the name of this other guy, the guy that had escaped. And he told the police that his name was Michael Kennedy. And if you remember, that was the new name that Danny had given himself when he went on the run after killing his father. After Danny Rowling or Michael Kennedy had escaped, the Gainesville police just started looking through the woods to see if they could find any evidence that maybe this man had left behind. And they actually came across a little makeshift campsite in the middle of the woods. They discovered a small tent, some other items that were used for camping. They found a couple of bags with some clothing in. And they also found a bag full of cash that was stained with red dye. Obviously indicating that it had been stolen from a bank. The police believed that the guy, the white male that had managed to escape, was living here on this campsite so the police collected all of this evidence that was found at the campsite and they put out an APB on Michael Kennedy however unfortunately this case just went cold for a while they couldn't find Mike Kennedy because obviously that wasn't the suspect's real name however now that Danny Rowling had been arrested on another armed robbery charge and they were looking into him the police decided to have a look through this evidence that had been collected from the campsite to see if they could link it back to him to see if Danny Rowling really was Michael Kennedy and if maybe he was also the Gainesville Ripper. If they could prove that he was the one who had committed that bank robbery then that's concrete proof that he was in Gainesville at the time of the murders. One of the items that they had collected from the campsite was actually a tape recorder and this tape recorder had a tape inside and when the detectives played it, they realised that it was Danny Rowling's voice, proving that it was him staying at this campsite and that he was Michael Kennedy. So I will play a clip of this tape recording now. I know I have to run the rest of my life, but I'm getting pretty good at it. I don't want you feeling sorry for me. I don't want you worrying about me. I'm a big boy. I take care of myself. We're all down here for just a breath anyway. Well, I'm gonna sign off for a little bit. I got something I gotta do. Detectives believe that Danny Rowling had recorded this for his mother, Claudia, and his brother, Kevin, and that it was taped before the first two Gainesville murders were committed. When he says at the end of the recording, quote, well, I'm gonna sign off for a little bit. I got something I got to do. They think that he is talking about the murders, about committing 
the murders. But that wasn't all that the detectives found. They also discovered a lot of forensic evidence on items from the campsite that directly linked Danny Rowling to the murders of the five Gainesville students. One of the items they found at the campsite was a ski mask and it was determined that the fibres from this ski mask matched fibres that were discovered on a small piece of duct tape that was left behind by the killer from the third murder scene. They also found traces of blood on a pair of Danny Rowling's pants that were found at the campsite and when this blood was tested it was found to be Manny Taboda's blood. Additionally, they discovered one of Crystal Hoyt's pubic hairs inside Danny Rowling's sleeping bag, and they also found a screwdriver at the campsite. And if you remember from earlier on in the video, the killer had used a screwdriver to break into the victims' homes on the nights that they were murdered. So this screwdriver that belonged to Danny Rowling was compared to the markings that that were on the doors at the murder scenes and it was a match. This was the exact screwdriver that had been used to break into the three apartments. So now the police had a substantial amount of evidence connecting Danny Rowling to the Gainesville Ripper case and so they decided to go and visit him in Marion County Jail. Remember he was there because he had been arrested for that armed robbery in Ocala. Anyway they went to visit him and they began questioning him about the Gainesville murders but he pretty much refused to say anything. He kept very, very quiet. And so the police asked him if they could take some DNA samples from him to test against the evidence they had, and he said yes. So they took samples of his blood and his saliva, etc., and they also asked him if they could take some samples of his pubic hairs. And once they asked him this, Danny Rowling stood up, he pulled down his underwear in front of everyone and he ripped out two handfuls of his pubic hair and then he just gave them to the detectives. Anyway, the police took all of these samples and they were sent off for testing and the results of these tests proved to be even more damning evidence against Rowling. It was found that his DNA was a match to the traces of semen that the police had recovered from all three crime scenes. The amount of forensic evidence they had against Danny Rowling by this point was overwhelming. There was just so much forensic evidence to prove that he was the guy they had been looking for. He was the Gainesville serial killer. And so after this, 37-year-old Danny Rowling was charged. He was charged with five counts of murder, three counts of armed burglary, and three counts of sexual battery. His trial was due to begin on the 1st of September 1993, and he had to go to trial because he decided to plead not guilty. However, the police and the prosecution were pretty concerned about this trial because the only evidence they had linking Danny to the crime was obviously the DNA and forensic evidence and the detectives were worried that this wouldn't be enough to convince the jury that he was guilty because back then obviously it was the early 90s and DNA and forensics was such a new thing that people just weren't familiar with and so the detectives were concerned that just having forensic evidence wouldn't be enough. They felt like they needed something else. They needed another piece of evidence that wasn't DNA related. And so they decided to visit Danny Rowling in prison to see if they could get him to confess to the murders. And eventually he did, kind of. He agreed to tell the detectives everything just as long as it could all be on his terms. He had to be the one in control of this situation. Basically, he said that he would give the detectives his confession, but only if his cellmate called Bobby Lewis could be there with him and speak for him. So the detectives would ask Danny a question about the murders, he would give his answer to Bobby, and then Bobby would give it to the police. So the two men sat down with the 
detectives and the interview began and Danny or Bobby even started talking the detectives through the murder spree. Danny claimed that he travelled to each murder scene on his bicycle and he said that he would just ride his bike to every apartment complex and then he would just watch people waiting to spot his perfect victim. And then following this, he confessed to all five murders. The murders of Sonia Larson, Christina Powell, Krista Hoyt, Manny Taboda, and Tracy Paulus. And so they asked him why, why did he kill these people? What was his motive? And his response was that he planned to kill eight people in total, one person for every single year he he had spent in prison. If you remember, I said earlier, he was constantly in and out of jail for the robberies he was committing, and in total, he had spent eight years in prison, and so he wanted to kill eight people. And the detectives believed that he had successfully done that. Not only had he killed the five students, but they strongly believed that he was also responsible for the murders of the Grissom family, the murder of Julie Grissom, her father Tom Grissom and her nephew Sean. However at this point when they asked him about the Grissom case, when they tried to question him about those murders, he actually refused to say anything about it. All he said was that he would quote, clear those up in due time. But he did confess to the Gainesville murders, although even though he had confessed to those, the prosecution were actually still expecting him to plead not guilty by reason of insanity in an attempt to get a lesser sentence. So they were completely shocked when that didn't happen he actually pleaded guilty in court. And the police believed that he did this because he just didn't want to go through the trial. He did not want to sit there day in, day out, whilst the prosecution went through all of the evidence. He just couldn't face it. He did not want to listen to the gruesome details of these vicious, vicious murders. And so he pled guilty. And on the 20th of April, 1994, Danny Rowling was sentenced to death for the five Gainesville murders. Just as a side note, Danny Rowling did later admit the murders of the Grissom family, I believe just shortly before his execution, and DNA evidence eventually proved that he was telling the truth. He was the Grissom family killer. I also just wanted to mention a woman who was actually attacked by Danny Rowling and survived. Just a couple of weeks before the murders in Gainesville, Danny Danny Rowling was in Sarasota in Florida and one night he broke into the home of a woman called Janet Frake and he attacked her. He bound her using duct tape and he even put duct tape over her eyes so that she couldn't see. After this he removed Janet's clothes and he raped her twice and he told Janet that he was going to continue raping her all night long and then afterwards he was just going to kill her. So of course Janet was absolutely terrified. She was so so scared but she really tried not to make that too obvious to Rowling. She tried to remain as calm as she possibly could in this situation and she she just began trying to talk to him like he was a friend. She knew that that was the only way that she could possibly survive this. She just had to try and calm him down and chat to him, hoping that he would spare her life. Janet was also very, very smart. She was actually really interested in true crime. She used to read a lot of true crime books and she knew that she had to try and keep some form of Danny's DNA in her house so that if he did end up murdering her, the police would hopefully be able to find it. So she made Danny a drink, she gave him a beer, hoping that when he picked her up, his fingerprints would be on the glass, and she also hid a towel in her home that had Danny semen on it. Like I said, thankfully, Janet survived this attack. Danny eventually left her home and he spared her life, and from what I can gather, Janet 
didn't go to the police after the incident to report it. She only came forward years later when she saw on the news that her rapist was in prison for the murders of five students and she finally felt safe enough to tell her story. Danny Rowling was executed on the 25th of October 2006 when he was 52 years old. He was put to death by lethal injection and many of his victims' family members actually attended this. They wanted to be there to watch him die. And that is it for this case. That is the case of Danny Rowling, aka the Gainesville Ripper. A very lengthy case. I feel like this video will be quite a long one. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. Before I go, I do just want to say a massive thank you once again to HelloFresh for kindly sponsoring this video. Remember, you can go to HelloFresh.com and use my code, which is 12MOLLY, to get 12 free meals and free shipping. I also just want to give a special shout out to the lovely members of my Patreon page. Thank you so, so much for your support, guys. If anyone else wants to become a member of our little Patreon family, then the link is always in the description box of my videos. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!